well, on the, on the relieve, when we were relieved, we used to um, come alongside and um, alongside of the landing and um, the keepers that were already on the dam who were one or at least one would be waiting to be relieved lowered a ladder on uh, supported by two ropes we used to call it the apple pickers ladder because it was was really it was a frail thing and uh, they used to sling the ropes over the girders that surrounded the tower and as the boat came in round uh, the bosun would say no and then you had to jump then to grab hold as high up the ladder as you could and then of course by the time you grabbed hold of that the boat had come away from under and uh, you climbed up um, it was during the war. Um, I was on duty. It was, well, it was in the middle of the morning. And I was out on the crane deck and a, a, a small convoy of vessels it, it was just coming in towards Portsmouth. And there was planes circling around that, um, in support of the... Uh, convoy and at the tail end I, I, I happened to look at one plane and he was acting a bit strangely to different to what the other planes were doing and as I watched now by this time the, 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 the convoy had, was about a mile away I suppose or half a mile and this plane circled round and to my amazement, all I could see of this plane was a thin line with the, the propeller in the middle. And I saw tracers leave it. It started firing. And I thought to myself, well, that's unusual. I, I, I didn't have time to do anything except to turn around and I threw myself down on the ground. Fortunately, it was inside of the crane deck and as I landed it was a, no sooner had I landed my backside was going in and out like this with uh, and it was like hell let loose cannon shells uh, was big firing and um, well it was only a matter of seconds you couldn't call it minutes before it was all over and I got up and, and uh, somebody said well what's, what's, I'm alive what, what's happened and I went out onto the crane deck and by the side of the doorway there was a hole about two inches across which was been more or less close to where I would have been standing when I see the tracers leave. And just inside, where I was laying down on the ground, by the side, there was a roll of, of, of corcus, I think they called it corcusine, it was like linoleum, thick stuff that the donkeys had sent off to put down in their side of the... And, well, it was about three feet, two to three feet in, across the diameter. And the cannon, the head of the cannon shell that hit just outside had gone right through the metal of the tower and was found later halfway through the, the roll of lino. And there was a hole like that right the way through the lino and I was like laying down the side of it. So I considered that I was very lucky. I was luckier than at the time we had the dockyard workers there. And on the deck below the crane deck, there's an open deck right the way round. 
and one of the dockyard chaps was stood there and he probably saw what I did and he tried to hide behind a, 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 a tank that was there uh, he, he tried to hide behind that but the one of the cannon shells hit the, the tower and exploded and of course he's out in the open he got the full force of that in his head and uh, of course they found him and uh, they brought him up and uh, they sent ashore and uh, he was dead before they you know, before they could uh, do anything about it. That was the uh, the worst uh, that was the worst episode that uh, I experienced there. And of course I suppose things like that affected me that um, as soon as the war was over, uh, the emotion began to take over and um, I came ashore sick and um, eventually they said that, uh, I don't know what, how they worded it, something that um, the condition that I was in, I was unable to carry on with my duties and that, that state would uh, would continue or something like that and um, they just pensioned me off that was a long time ago So I was on the Nap Tower in 1971, and the Nap Tower is the most peculiar place. It's like rather like living inside a, a black gasometer. It gets freezing cold in winter and baking hot in summer because it's all made out of iron. And originally it was designed as part of an anti-submarine defence system running across the eastern approaches of the Solent. Um, basically speaking, it's, it, it's a metal drum, which I think has about about eight or ten stories inside, and Trinity House took over the top floor for their navigation system. Now when I was there, everything we needed was contained on the top floor. That was the generators, the fog signal, bedrooms, mechanics quarters, we had a radio beacon, which one of the old radio beacons with a rotary converter at the bottom, and the kitchen had a radio burn in, there was a separate radio room, and also, amongst all this, on the top story was uh, the quarters for the dockyard workers who came out every year to check on the, the plates under the water, just to make sure it's structurally sound. And they did repairs and whatever. Um, on the roof of the nab, it had two uh, navigation lights. One was red, which I believe was over the east, and a white light to the west. And they were contained in what was almost like a couple of couple of telephone boxes, if you like. Two large cylindrical objects with a door at the back. And the tiny little mercury bath lenses, they're beautiful, I didn't know where they went to. They're only about, oh, about a couple of feet high, I think, and uh, about a foot or so diameter. And they had to be wound up once a night, around about midnight. I had a little hand, I used to wind them up. And they used to revolve fairly slowly. And on the outside of these, um, what I call telephone boxes, there was just a, a semicircular screen and little ball, bullseye lenses that turned very slowly and shine their beams out of this out of this weird box. Now together with that, that was the main navigation lights. There was a diaphragm fog signal, which was mounted in the middle of the roof, 
and a bell. So you can imagine when you were sounding, you had the diaphragm going, you had two engines running, you had the bell sounding, and you had the radio beacon going inside with the rotary converter. So it's a pretty noisy place. Um, access to the top floor was either from the outside by a crane and a landing, small landing deck. Uh, we're taking coal and other uh, supplies from there. And there were two spiral staircases that went right the way down through the building to the bottom floor. And that gave you access to a small landing for, for boat work. But when they initially sank, they, they floated the whole nab tower to a great big concrete base, much like the Royal Sovereign. When they got it out on position, they sank it, and apparently it went down onto soft sand, because ever since it had a 15 degree list, so the thing's actually tilting. So all the floors had to go down a uphill, and uh, the landing is always high and dry one side, and it's almost underwater the other. It's a strange place. Of course, all painted black, so it absorbs heat like mad in the summer. That's why it gets so hot. And uh, you know, it's just the most, most odd place, but I gather all that's changed. You say it was cold on the mess, so what was the uh, winter like? Well, I was never actually there in winter, but from what I hear, it used to be bitterly cold, being an iron structure. It really was. Apparently, it even had frost on the inside of the walls at times. Now, when I was on the nav, I had the outside bedroom, which is virtually the mechanics quarters, which had two bunks in there. And that was all right on the outside wall. And uh, as I said earlier, in the summer months when I was there, it's, the walls got really hot. And they, but they said in winter that uh, sometimes windows frosted over and it really got pretty cold. But there's no central form of heating apart from the Rayburn, which was in the kitchen. And that had a back boiler which heated up all the hot water. So at least you'd always have a hot shower, a hot wash, which is very nice. But apart from that, I don't recall any other independent forms of heating in, in, the, in the tower itself. Yeah. I your experience at St. Catharines when you were... Oh, St. Catharines. Yeah, I was sure. This was during the war. I was sure from the NAB. And um, the superintendent said, um, Squid, he said, um, I want you to go to St. Catharines um, either this Tuesday or next Tuesday. To relieve uh, the PK, he, he's due for, to go to London on a Whitley Council. It's only just for the day, he said. And I, I wanted my leave on that occasion when I come ashore. So uh, I said, well, which day is it to be? Is it this, this Tuesday or next Tuesday? He said, I'll let you know. So within... A, an hour or two, he said it would be this Tuesday. Oh, I said, well, can I have my, start my leave following my, well, well, when I come back? So uh, off I went to down to St Catharines and um, relieved uh, Mr Grenville. The entry was put in the journal. I've got a copy of it, a photograph of it. And um, anyway, um, <coughs> I spent the day there, and um, I, I had to, to about nine o'clock in the morning. I had to report. I know it was first thing. I spent the whole day there, 
and of course um, I had to take over his his duties, which was the same every week. And on the Tuesday, I was in the engine room clearing up round the engines and tidy up in general. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, because the engine room was only fabricated. It was only like what's the name, um, roof. Like slated roof. I thought to myself, if, if this was bombed, they wouldn't stand much chance. And of course, that was that. So, anyway, uh, I stayed there the day. Yeah, that, that, that was that. That ended that day. And, and at the end of the day, I uh, scrambled was back and I signed, I signed off, didn't I? It was the same day, wasn't it? And um, of course that was it. And I started my leave. We went down to Somerset. On a, and while I was there, we rang up relatives at Knighton. And they lo and behold, they said, of course they had to be careful what they said on the phone. Wartime, everything was uh, censored and you could be had up for anything. And I said, oh, we've had visitors uh, on the island at, at, at uh, down the lighthouse and you won't see your friends anymore, or something like that. And it turned out that um, that was the next Tuesday, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, it turned out that um, they were doing, the two keepers were doing exactly the same work as what I was doing the week before. Um, Charlie Tompkins, who lived in the tower, was off duty, and um, he, I suppose he got the alert, the double red alert that enemy action was imminent, and he rushed across to the, to the, uh, tell the keepers to watch out, and he no sooner got in there than up it went. Direct hit, wasn't it? Huh? Direct hit, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, direct hit. They only found bits and pieces. So you chose the right week to be there? Well, then. that's how it turned out to be. But, um, as I say, years afterwards, I've got a, a copy of the journal. If you've seen it, yes. whether you want to take a picture of it. You've got where they signed on, didn't they? But they never signed off that day. Yeah, well, that was I did that one for Red Simo's benefit, because Red Simo he he went there. He was the first keeper after the occasion. I think he he was he hadn't have been uh, appointed. He was uh, only a young keeper then. Now he's only a year or two younger than what I am. I recorded an interview with a Reg Simmons, who was a principal keeper, and during this interview, the tape on my video machine broke down, and it was one of a kind video. I couldn't go back and repeat it because I didn't find out till much later, but I managed to piece together bits of what he said. And it's a shame it was right at a crucial piece about St. Catherine's Lighthouse bombing. 
he was ashore from the beach he had. He had this message from the depot saying that he and a light ship skipper were to be sent to St. Catherine's to help out there as the place had been bombed and the free keepers killed. He said when he got there, on, on St. Catherine's they had four air receivers. These are the receivers that uh, the air's pumped into from the compressors to make the foghorn go and they're quite large and when he got there there was one was in a field next to the station one was up against the wall at the principal keepers quarters another was up against another wall and one had vanished completely from then on the videotape breaks down and you just get little bits of audio so all the rest of what he said is lost, I'm afraid. The original Needles Lighthouse was established on top of the cliffs in Scratchells Bay in the 18th century, I believe. Um, but it was found, much the same as many of the lighthouses built on high ground, so it was constantly shrouded in low cloud and mist, and obviously it was useless as a navigation aid. So the decision was made to build a lighthouse at the end of the Needles, where we are now, and they brought in um, a chap named Walker to design the tower and the lighthouse was built and established in 1858. And since then it's been regularly manned, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, for 136 years. And that 
process will come to an end this November. So it's a long history. The tower is about 100 feet high, it's built of granite, and it's the only tower in the Trinity House service, the Tower of Rock, which has uh, perpendicular sides. You find most towers on the western end, like Wolf Rock, Edison, Bishop Rock, have got wasted as a wasted tower, more like a chess piece. But this one looks like a bit like a hollow new roll. And um, it's also peculiar being the one of the only few towers I've ever seen without storm shutters on the windows. There's one downstairs on the engine room, and the only other place I've come across this is in Plymouth Breakwater, in Plymouth Sound, which was a smaller tower, but they had large windows, and that was very light and airy inside, much the same as this is. Um, each room is 15 feet in diameter, so it's quite, uh, quite roomy inside, and there's seven storeys. You start with, at the basement, there's the engine room. Next floor up is the storeroom, which is now going to be turned into a battery room, and at the time of recording this, it's been completely stripped out, as in the presses are being painted, and the new equipment will be in within the, within the next month or so. Above that is the kitchen, which is our general living room, and washroom, and office, and everything else is done in the kitchen. Above which is a bedroom, which can house and uh, accommodate five men all together. Currently there are only two keepers on station and two engineers. And the keepers are required to maintain a night watch. That's uh, from four o'clock in the afternoon around until eight o'clock in the morning. Now from eight in the morning till four, one of the engineers takes over the responsibilities of uh, keeping a sea watch. And then above the bedroom is the service room, where the telemetry system, uh, the electronic gear, and the monitoring system will be housed. Then immediately above that, and below where I'm standing, where I'm sitting, <laughs> where I'm sitting on this bicycle, yes, um, is the lower lantern. That houses the, at the moment, air tanks, air compressors for the fog signal, and the coders. Now, all those will be taken out eventually. There will be an electric fog signal, um, a fog detector, and nothing much else. The only thing which will be a, remain up here will be the air tanks, which will be um, uh, decommissioned. And then, of course, immediately above that, we're in the land and where we're sitting now. It's a foggy day on the Needles Lighthouse. This is in the kitchen. Three engines running up and the fog on going. You'll hear in a minute how loud it can be. And if you think that's loud, the bedroom's one floor nearer the fog on. So any second now, it should go off. <laughs> enough to fit the tower like the Wolf Rock and the, and the long ships and the uh, Eddiston and other places down the west. It's mainly because we're in fairly shallow water. So the sea tends to break before it reaches the tower. I mean, we do get seas up to the kitchen window and sometimes up to the bedroom window. But I've ever, ever only once known the tower to shake just through the force of the sea. And that was almost about 10 years ago, I think. But the sea does come right over the back. There's, a, there's a, um, an artificial wall which shelters the landing over at the back. And uh, it breaks over there very regularly. So what sort of height is the kitchen and bedroom if you get waves up there? Bedroom window must be about 40 feet. And the, I'm sorry, the kitchen window must be about 40 feet and the bedroom about 60 feet. It just slops in. It's not green water, but it's, it's pretty heavy, heavy spray and scud and all the rest of it. But I have actually seen sea coming over the top of the needles, which is around the back here, and there on a level where we're sitting now, which is over 100 feet. So it gets quite spectacular. And the other thing is, being um, an almost vertical pinnacle of rock, 
you get the wind blowing uh, from the south and southwest, but on the other side, you get a vacuum created. And that tends to draw the sea up, and you get spumes of uh, sea and spray um, vortexing on the, on, the, on the leeward side. It's quite spectacular. Now over to my left, this is a critical rarity, this is called an impulse clock and all it does is decode the standby battery light. If the main bulb fails and the standby bulb fails, you've got no power up there, you put in the battery light which works off the batteries to my right and this just gives it its character. That's all it does. That's been here since 1947 and we still have the original handbook for it. Here we are in the lower lantern, and this is where the compressors are for the fog signal. The two coders, everything on lighthouses is duplicated. And underneath this cover, you'll find two 100 volt motors, which turn in three cans. Now then, with this particular system, it's designed by Trinity House. Two cams at the front here work the fog signal and there's one at the back which works the light. They both come from the same motor. To control them, there again you have duplicate controls here. And there's a little relay in here which works from that impulse clock downstairs. And what this does is to bring in these resistors. Now the way this light operates, the light is switched on, you get full brilliance, then drawing its two eclipses every 20 seconds, one of these resistors will come in and it just dims the light. It doesn't quite go out, it just keeps the filament glowing red. And then the code will switch it off again and we get full brilliance. And that's a very simple system and it's pretty well foolproof. Can you explain the red and green, green shades, the red light? Yes, well, I think the camera's picking up some red shades behind me. There are a series of red and green shades around the lantern. And basically speaking, the red sectors, as we call them, mark off the, the dangerous areas of sea. The one behind me shines directly from the needles to St Catharines, which is about 20 miles away along the coast of the Isle of Wight. Now, any shipping that goes inshore and picks up the red light between the two, they know they're standing in danger. If they go out towards the sea and come into this white light, which you can just see to the left of the, the frame, uh, that shines over clear water up, out into the main channel. And once they come round over to the west and start entering the needles channel, they come into a red light again. And the red light shines along the shingles bank, which runs from the southwest shingles buoy, which is almost due west of us here, right the way along up to the northeast to Hearst Castle. And all the time, any ship goes past there, there'll be in a red light, which shows the redendron. Just beyond Hearst Castle, there's a white beam. There's just a white, short, uh, a narrow white sector. And that marks clear water in the middle of the channel. And as they go around Fort Albert, they come into a green sector, which shows uh, they're in the area of Colwell Bay. Now, when they're coming out in the other direction, they should always keep the green on their port side. It's really to show which direction the sailing would go, actually. Because as you know, the rule of sea is when you're going into port, the red light's always on your port side and the green light's always on the starboard. So at night you know which direction you're sailing in. 